Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, for those listening online for the first time, we are a direct overflow of Calvary Chapel Grants Pass. Uh, open your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 3. As we're going to continue on in the resurrected life, looking briefly at the life of Peter, but more specifically, the day of the Lord. And what I want to do, because this is such a rich chapter and there's so much meat in it, is actually break this chapter up into two weeks. And so what we're going to do is take the first several verses tonight and then next week hit the rest. And so we're going to pick it up in verse 1, 2 Peter Chapter 3, it says, the day of the Lord will come, picking it up in verse 1. It says, this is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both, of, in both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandments of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the Father fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlooked this fact, however, verse 5, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these, the word that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, verse 7, in heaven, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a, a thousand years, in a thousand years, as one day, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. And so we see that God is eternally faithful to his word and to his promises, make no mistake about it. And all of us, every living soul, shall give an account to God. Let's pray and just ask that he would bless this time. So Heavenly Father, God, I just pray, Lord, that you would speak your word clearly. God, I just pray, Lord, that you would just, uh, for those in here, God, those listening online, God, those tuning in, God, for some of us who have experienced maybe discouragement or fear this week, God, I pray that you'd come and settle our hearts and minds, that you would speak as you see fit. God, that you would just tune our hearts, tune our ears towards your word and what you have to say. God, I pray that you just bless this time. Father God, we love you so much and just ask these things in your name. Amen. Okay, 2 Peter chapter 3. I've entitled tonight's message, The Day of Redemption. And as an opening thought, kind of a uh, point that was kind of given to me as I studied is that we have to keep in mind when we approach this passage and we approach the gospel and uh, just the gospel of Jesus Christ and some of these letters, we have to understand, uh, you guys, that it's not going to be glorious for everyone. The day of redemption is not going to be a day of redemption and glory for everyone. For some, it's going to be terror, and it's going to be anguish, and it's going to be destruction and judgment. And so I want to encourage you that as we open this passage, as we get into God's word, as we look at his word, uh, because the, the question or kind of a theme that's going to get brought up or an idea, where is your heart this evening? Are you allowing your heart to be soft towards the things of God? Because so often I know that I have a hard heart, and so we need to understand contextually looking at this point, moving from 1 Peter to 2 Peter, as Peter writes that this is now the second letter. We see that Peter has now shifted from a tone of encouragement in 1 Peter, exhorting the brethren and strengthening the brethren as they had experienced uh, persecution and they were, be they were being driven all over the place. He has now shifted in to 2 Peter with a little bit more uh, a firmer tone, you guys. He's... Uh, 
giving an encouragement and he's warning in chapter two, actually rebuking and warning against false teachers and talking about the destruction and the judgment that has been waiting for thousands of years. You guys, God's not slack concerning his promises. He hasn't forgotten you. He, he hasn't lost sight of you. He knows what's going on. And with these false preachers and the false gospel and these people that have different ideas, you guys, they're going to give an account to God. And so will we. And so we take heart knowing that Jesus Christ paid the way. And so looking at this passage, we're going to see somewhat of an outline. We're going to see the dangers of a hard heart, the grace and mercies of God, and the day of redemption. And so kind of an opening statement, we're going to, or an opening uh, just points to look at, we're going to see kind of just um, a threefold application. And first and foremost, in the sense we see that we can rebuke people in love. We see this as Peter goes from a tone of love and encouragement to warning against false teachers, and that's going to be key for us to pick up on and come back to. Uh, and that secondly, as Christians, we need to guard against being, being against lukewarm. And then finally, as third, Christians, we should be stirring up one another. You guys, we should be encouraging one another to not become sluggish, not become hard-hearted, not become uh, you know, stale or distant or hardened towards the things of God. Hebrews 3.13, but exhort one another every day as long as it is called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as in the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing. You guys get that? That the word of God reminds us, encourages us, don't give up, don't quit, don't let your brother slack, don't let your brother get away with, with sin, living in sin. You see, you see sin going on, you call it out. Yes, you're loving, you're graceful, you're kind, but you encourage one another. You are your brother's keeper. And I think it's important to keep in mind, shout out to House of Luke, by the way, if they're tuning in, as many of you uh, may know, some of you don't. I spent up to four years in a men's home with uh, Pastor Tom Prokop and Pastor Robert Valencia and uh, Pastor Dwayne Bryant, uh, shout out to them tuning in. But you guys, we, we are, uh, we're our brother's keepers. And we, we need to, you know, when we see our brother or sister slipping in Christ, we need to be willing to say, hey, that's not adding up. I know, uh, I remember one time, Max, who's one of the overseers here in town at U-Turn, uh, it was some time ago, one morning came strolling in and uh, there had been a mix-up, and he, he had thought he had seen me driving around in the neighborhood, which isn't the best place to be, and he asked me about it. He said, hey, I don't know if that was you, but if it was you, what were you doing driving around? What were you doing in this neighborhood? And as surprised as I was, I was encouraged by this. I was encouraged by that, that he took the time to say, hey, is everything good, you guys? Hey, Peter, he, he, he's, he's now at the end of his life. And he's looking back, and I can just imagine the tone of Peter, just um, kind of the highs and lows, and uh, who he was as an individual. And uh, as we're doing afternoon devotions uh, earlier in the week, I took a look at Peter, uh, just to who he was before and after uh, meeting with Christ. And there's so much that we can learn about him uh, that we're going to get into. But looking at this, it, it, it's just... Um, the Lord really encouraged me looking at this passage and um, going through specifically the, the book of First and Second Peter, you guys, that our lives, that how we live our lives, it absolutely matters. The integrity and the holiness of how we live our lives, you guys, we can't because, uh, it, it, you know, and this is something that hopefully if we have time we're again to, but, it, you know, the, see, this passage is talking about scoffers, and it's talking about those from a long, uh, from a long time ago that it was predicted that they were going to come, and and while the context is false teachers, I think there is an application in the sense that if we're not careful against guarding our own hearts, that we, be, we become lukewarm and we can become scoffers. And so looking at Peter, who was he? Now he's at the end of his life looking back and uh, 
writing the, these letters or writing the, these books. And so first and foremost, we see that he was a successful man who is very decisive. And what I mean by this is specifically when we go to the account of Mark, which we won't do for time, and we find out that he was, uh, you know, he was a very successful fisherman. He worked with a company that did well. He probably spoke uh, several languages or a, a couple, you know, a little bit of uh, several different languages. He knew how to trade. He knew how to make a living. Uh, you know, and I, I think about that. I think about what it must have been like for Peter to leave everything behind and to follow Christ. We know that when Jesus tells them to drop his nets, it wasn't the first time that they had met. You know, he had spent some time, when we go to the account of John, we see that they had spent some time together. Uh, but according to Mark uh, chapter 1, we see that he was a, he was a successful man. He, he, he knew how to make a living, you guys, and, and th- this encourages me specifically because what this means is that, you know, sometimes I think, and this is something that I've hit before a little bit, but, you know, we we can kind of come to this place where we believe that to walk with the Lord requires no intelligence, that we're almost simple-minded folks, that we can't, you know, we don't, you know, we're, we're, we're not... We're not sure where we want to go in life or what we want to do. We're not sure really what we believe. And so Jesus comes along and he's kind of this unassuming hippie that kind of has this plan to maybe kind of bring love. You know, that's not how it went, you guys. They gave up their whole lives. Secondly, however, we see as successful as he was in his decisiveness and being a leader that he was a man of foolishness. We see that as much as he led the pack, he also led the pack in mistakes, constantly being rebuked and constantly having to be sat down by Jesus. And so I get encouraged looking at Peter, just seeing the conflicted nature that existed in him. Uh, Just in short, looking at kind of just a couple examples, we see in Matthew 14 that he was the one that walked on water but then sank. In Matthew 16, he was praised for Jesus by having wisdom to speak about spiritual things and verses later rebuked as Satan. You guys feeling discouraged? When was the last time the Lord called you Satan? We see that he was one of the chosen ones to see the transfiguration in Matthew 17. Then moments later speaks out in fear as the text literally says in Peter, not knowing what to say, spoke up. What's the encouragement? You guys, the encouragement, you guys, is that God will use the people we don't think can be used. God will use the people that we don't think have the ability to carry on in ministry. We see in Matthew 26 that he praised Jesus and told him that he would follow him wherever only to chop off the ear of a Roman soldier because he was not aware of God's plan. And then later in Matthew 26, after claiming to follow Jesus wherever he went on to deny him. And so I can only imagine Peter now towards the end of his life. Looking back, see, we see that Peter was a man of success and a man of failures. He was a man of decisiveness, but he was a man who was also impulsive we can almost catch the tone all the years later, the man who walked on water but sank, the man who wasn't afraid to get out of the boat when everyone sat down but was too scared to tell a servant girl that he was a follower of Christ all these years later. And if you notice, when you go into First and Second Peter, we see that he starts, uh, when he starts First Peter, he calls himself an apostle. A bond servant. You guys get that? That the callings and giftings of God are not revocable. You guys, if God's called you to something, He is going to see you through it. If God's called you to a situation or to a season or to a ministry or to a task, He's going to give you what you need. And just because you don't feel like you're equipped, just because you feel like maybe you've somehow failed, you guys, God, He's not done with you. He's going to take you and He's going to use you and He's going to teach you. He's going to lead you. How are you handling the highs and lows in life? And so looking at this as we jump into it, I think a key point of application is that we understand that 
as the callings of Christ can never be taken away, that we need to understand that Jesus never looked at Peter as an unfinished work. He looked at Peter as a finished work. You guys, God, when he looks at you, he's not looking at you for all your failures and all the ways you've messed up, you know, and maybe, maybe it's just me, but I can't count how many times I've sworn to the Lord that I'll do better, and then I'll walk with him closer, and that I'll serve him only to find out that in the end that I'm not strong as, as strong as I thought I was. Anyone else here listening online? Anyone else go through that where they, they, they think we think we have what it takes and in the end we realize that our faith buckles and we feel disqualified? Real quick, go to John chapter 20. I'm sorry, John chapter 21. And I just want to look at The first couple of verses. Because one of the thoughts that I was thinking is if there's ever someone to be used by the Lord, and if there's ever someone to be uh, the leader of the pack, I don't think it's going to be the one that denied Christ. Pick it up, John 21 it says, After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he, he revealed himself in this way Simon Peter, Thomas called the the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said, we will go with you. And so what we see is, you guys, Peter, well, for all his highs and all his lows, the disciples followed him. Why would you possibly follow the one who just denied Jesus? Because what we see is that whether it was his calling, which I personally believe, or whatever it may have been, there was something in Peter that made him a natural leader. See, this is kind of an idea that gets presented in this text that we need to understand, or maybe not through this text, but through the life of Peter, um, that if, you, if you've made mistakes in the faith, that means you're trying. I get, if, you, if you've never made any mistakes in the faith, you're not trying. You're sitting in a lukewarm spot in the back row, and you're just letting things work themselves out. You know, the, the ones who fail are the ones who try. And I think it's key for us to pick that up. And, and I find it so amazing that Jesus didn't reject Peter. Rather, he looked at Peter as a completed work. In fact, and I spoke on this on Wednesday in the afternoon devotions, but when Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene, he says, go and get the disciples. And Peter also. He mentions Peter by name specifically. You guys, your story is not over. Your failures haven't taken you out of the plan and will of God. Yes, there may be some major repercussions. You fell into sin. Yes, guess what? You're going to have to deal with the consequences of sin. And you're going to have to deal with the fact that you fell away, you guys. But take heart. We understand that if anyone has been made new in Christ, he's a new creation. And so... 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and the new has come. Romans 6.6, 6, We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. And finally, 1 Corinthians 15, 9 through 10. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me is not in vain. You guys get that? that Paul is saying, hey, I'm not who I should be, but I'm not who I used to be. God's grace hasn't been in vain. So I ask you, are you receiving the grace of God?
And so picking it up, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Now this is the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember that the, remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing that, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming for ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. The word here for, sin- for sincere, when Peter says that uh, I stir up your sincere minds, it literally means found pure when examined by the sun. And so what would happen is they would literally, what, what, what would the vendors, the pottery would crack under the sun. And so what they would do, or maybe the temperature is they were forging. So what they do is they take wax and they'd cover the cracks. And so what people wanted to do or what people needed to do is that when they examine, they examine the uh, pottery, they bring it out into the sun to see what cracks, to see if wax had covered it, to see what it looked like. You guys, and so the, the, the connection, the application is that when the sun examines our lives, what does he find? When the sun examines your heart, what does he look at? Because, or what does he see? Because looking at this, see, contextually, we have to understand, you guys, that it's speaking of false teachers, but it, 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 make no mistake about it. For you to follow or to fall into sinful desires or to sinful to, to pursue your lust, you don't have to be a prominent teacher to mislead. You don't have to be someone who's, uh, you know, a, a false teacher out of a church in Reading to mislead people. That's a direct reference to Bethel and Bill Johnson, by the way, call out false teachers. And my wife actually encouraged me in this thought where she said, you know what? She said, if you're chasing your sin, you're teaching your heart and you're leading your heart astray. If you're following sin and you're leading others to sin, you're a false teacher. You're leading their hearts into sin. That old song, be careful little eyes what you see. Be careful little ears what you hear. Be careful little feet where you go. Why? Because your heavenly Father is looking down. You guys, and we need to understand, you guys, we take courage and we take comfort because make no mistake about it, you guys, if you have given your life to the Lord, because one of the thoughts here, when when I think of sincere, I think it's key that we need to pick up and we need to understand that just because we feel that we're holy or we feel like we're doing right, doesn't doesn't necessarily mean that we're meeting God's standards. We need to apply his word to our life. But on the flip side of that, just because you feel discouraged, just because you feel like you can't be used, just feel because you feel like you're inadequate, just because you feel like you're so dirty and you're so sinful, you guys, you've been set apart if you've given your, your life to the Lord. First Peter 1, 3 through 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven, for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. First Peter 2 9. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Ephesians 4.30 And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. You guys, the life we live, it matters. And so uh, what I want to do, the word for here, for desires, it actually means when it talks about following desires, it's um, a forbidden craving. Man. Genesis 6 tells us that God looked down and saw the wickedness of man. 
And then they had evil in their hearts all the days of their life. And so what I want to do, <clears throat> I believe it was Tuesday morning, Alistair Begg gave eight signs or eight outcomes of a hardened heart or a cold heart. And so what I want to do is I'm working off memory without being able to take notes as I was listening at work and also just going back in my own studies bringing in my own thoughts according to the text, according to the word. I want to give up giving credit to Alistair Begg. As there's going to be six points, which four of them are his, and uh, the last two are mine. Scripture says to give honor to whom honor is due, but I want to give six signs of a hardened heart or six outcomes. And so first and foremost, we see a prideful heart A prideful heart in that you reject the opinions of others and you reject the teachings or you reject the advice of your leaders and you're consistently looking at your, you're looking at yourself as better than others. Proverbs 14, 6 says, a scoffer seeks in vain, but knowledge is easy to him who has understanding. Proverbs 26 says, a fool's wiser in his own eyes than seven sensible men. Are you that fool that thinks your opinion is better than seven sensible men? You need to repent. You're being a scoffer. And so first and foremost, we see a prideful heart or a prideful spirit. Secondly, we see not wanting to be around spirit-filled believers. Why? Because if, you're, if your heart is lukewarm and your heart is half dead, you're not going to want to come around spirit-filled believers. You, you know, you're going to have, you, you, you want to be around half dead Christians. You, you're lukewarm. You want to go hang out and drink beers with the half dead Christians in the graveyard. Stop being so lukewarm, you guys our life it matters and it, let, let me tell you let me just say and this is not to you know throw it at anyone rather myself before anyone if you're sitting around and you're more focused about drinking beers and playing music with your buddies you're not looking for the day of redemption you're not looking up if you're more focused on your hobbies you're not looking for the day of redemption you're a half-filled, lukewarm believer. And I say that gently because I do, you guys, we need to understand that leisure comes from God. And I'm not being legalistic. I'm not saying that we can't enjoy ourselves. But specifically, what is your response and what is your reaction when you, be, when you come around a spirit-filled believer? Third, we see not enjoying corporate worship. Now, this is important because I think it's key that the word here is enjoying corporate worship, where you can still see, as a, you know, with a scoffing heart or a prideful heart, a mocking heart, you can still come around worship. You'll still raise your hands and you'll still say the words, but guess what? You're going to be more concerned about the football game. You're going to be more concerned about your social media. You're going to be more concerned about the algorithms of social media and this person like this person and this person comment on this person and the whole time in the house of God and the assembly of God as people are worshiping you guys. And I, I get it. It's not, it. Hey, it's not always easy. Sometimes my heart is very dry and dead. You guys, but I, that's, don't you get when your heart is dry and your heart is dead and you don't feel like coming into God's promises or God's presence, that's when you need to come in most. One theologian actually went on to say that he'd rather teach two men how to pray than ten men how to preach. What is your view of corporate worship? Are you more focused on social media and sports and the distractions of your life? Fourth, we see a, hit, a life of hidden sin. Specifically, your life has cracks when it's brought up in light of the sun. And, you know, we all, you guys... We all go through sin. We all go through situations. But what I'm talking about is specifically not allowing your heart to become hard towards the things of the Lord. Hebrews 3, 7 through 9. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. On the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test 
and saw my works for 40 years. Romans 2, 5. But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day. Hey, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. You guys, because we need to understand that the same sun that melts butter can harden clay. What's the condition of your heart? Five, we see that as there's hidden sin, eventually those with a scoffing heart learn to embrace sin. What I mean by this, again, to quote Alistair Begg, they will introduce you to their lovers in the mall. End quote. They will invite you over for nights of drinking and carnality. They will have no problem with the fact that they're living in adultery. And six, they begin to justify their sin or twist scripture for their own gain. Pick it up, verse seven says, but by the same word, the heavens and earth that now existed are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. The word here for destroying, it means utter destruction or literally the destruction which consists of eternal misery in hell. The destruction which consists of eternal misery of hell. Lamentations 2, 20 through, 22 through 23. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Micah 7, 18. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression? For the remnant of his inheritance... He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. You guys, Peter, at the end of his life, he's looking back and he's saying, hey, you're a chosen vessel. You're a royal priesthood. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't become discouraged. Don't fall into a hard heart because of the things you're going through. Because I, I know personally, I know myself, I, get, I can get very discouraged when things begin to add up. And they add up. And it, it, it's just you get to the point where you want to quit, you guys. But we have to understand, you guys, that, it, that God's timing and promises. See, when, when we look at this, a couple thoughts that I was hit with. Because when we study this passage, it's a direct reference to Genesis 6. And it says, by the same word, the heavens and earth that are now, now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. And when Peter here is talking about the waters and he's talking about the, the, the prophets and Jesus Christ and overlooking the fact that God brought judgment in Noah's days, he's literally saying, hey, these people are scoffing. They're overlooking the fact that God's judgment already came once. They're intentionally ignoring the fact that God already did this once and a thought that I was kind of hit with is that if God said in Genesis 6 that he would never or as he brings out judgment as he floods the earth and no one is spared save Noah and the seven that were with him can you just imagine being Noah with all those animals man you must have hopefully Noah liked animals that's a long time to be with seven other people and a bunch of animals. But one of the thoughts that I was hit with, you guys, is that if after the flood, if God promised that he would never flood the earth, that when we see these storms that come through that take out whole cities, Hurricane Katrina and take out whole states or some of the flooding in the Philippines that take out quarters of the country, God doesn't even consider that a flood. What does his judgment look like if he said that he'd never flood the earth and we have storms that come through and wipe out an entire country, but God doesn't even define that as an actual flood? What does the power of his judgment look like? And secondly, we see that if something is not coming to pass, or if something is not being brought out, it's not that God's not working. It's that God is long-suffering. He's patient and kind. Do you guys get that? That when there's sin 
in life or when there's evilness in this world, when there's evilness in our lives that we experience or there's sin and and we're wondering why God doesn't deal with it or you even see sin in your own life and you're scoffing thinking you got away with it, you didn't get away with it. That's literally God's mercy looking at you saying, are you going to repent? Are you going to trust the promises of the Lord? The idea here for slack is that God doesn't delay. And I find it interesting. Verse 8 says, But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises. We see that it's literally the mercies of God, and we have to understand the power of who he is. One theologian goes on to say, all things are equally near and present to his view. The distance of a thousand years before the occurrence of event, it is no more to him than would be the interval of a day. With God, indeed, there is neither past, present, nor future. He takes for his name the I am. He is the I I am. I am in the present. I am in the past and I am in the future. Just as we say of God that he is everywhere. So we may say of him that he is always, he is everywhere in space. He is everywhere in time. He has resources in a depth that we know nothing about. And he waits from on high in heaven for his for the nations and his children to repent. Isaiah 46 through 8, a voice says, Cry, and I said, What shall I cry? All flesh, all flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The, gla- the grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God will stand forever. God sees with the perspective we lack, even the delay, as one theologian says, of a thousand years may well seem like a day against the back cloth of eternity. Furthermore, God sees time with the intensity we lack. One day with the Lord is like a thousand years. And so we see in closing two points that first and foremost that he longs that all would come to him and repent and that secondly we see in the power of all these things. See the same word here, we see that that he's going to have his worship regardless. Because the same word here, we, we see the same word that caused the flood, it holds the nations in place. As one legend puts it, The word for sincere here comes from the Latin word Sarah. And so, as I said, what they would do is they would, the vendors would cover their cracks. But the point of the whole legend with the original language in the Latin is that, see, they were looking to see the cracks, and they were looking to see if it would break. And here's the thing, you guys, if faith, because faith and righteousness are always going to be connected. And if we couldn't be holy, it wouldn't matter, you guys, but we can be holy. If we couldn't overcome in trials, because the point of uh, uh, the word Sarah, it, it's wax, and it literally means without wax, right? And, and so the idea is that when you're, you know, the, it breaks down under the sun, and you can see the wax, right? And so we see that in trials, we break down. In trials, we lose our footing, and we give up, and we fall away. You guys, but righteousness, it's connected to faith, and you guys, you can be holy, you can live a righteous life. And, that, and that's what encourages us that, that God, he, he, you know, he hasn't made things impossible. He gave his only son. And so literally, when I'm faced with the storms of this life and the way of the day, I can look to him and I can say, hey, I can't take this weight. I just need you to take it for me. I, I, I just need, you know, I need to be hidden in you right now. Isaiah 42, by no means will he cast out a broken reed. Because he won't reject your small faith. He won't reject your small steps of moving towards righteousness. And so in closing, kind of a, closing, kind of a thought I was hit with. As we're encouraged to not 
have hard hearts that this world and all its majesty and power runs as it does with the savior of the world sitting on the throne. And the question that I was hit with, what will it look like when he stands up off that throne to judge the world? All this earth moves with him sitting down. What will it look when he stands up? You guys, will your life bear up under the sun? Will you be found pure and spotless? Will you be found sincere? Because the righteousness of our own. You see, this is important that we understand. For anyone listening, for anyone wondering what it takes to walk with God, if you're placing your righteousness in your power to sin or not sin, if you are placing your confidence in your own ability, you are on shaky ground. But if you are placing your assurance and your confidence in your righteousness upon the Savior of the world and in his footing, the God of Israel, who never sleeps nor slumbers, my trust is in you. My faith is in you. And through the Son, through the blood of Christ, I am found sincere and found spotless and found without wax, hiding the cracks. And so I take this scoffing heart that put Christ up on the cross and I say, God, I am a scoffer. I am a wicked man who threw you on the cross. I repent of my sins. And he comes and he makes us new and he makes us clean. Because God hasn't, left you out to dry. He knows exactly where you are. He knows exactly what you're going through. Don't have a hard heart, you guys. Let's pray. So Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you for your word. I pray that you would bless the rest of the evening. God, you give anyone here traveling mercies or as we come and go. God, for anyone listening online, God, that we take the time to humble ourselves, repent of our sin, confess you as Savior, and experience the freedom and hope of everlasting life. God, we love you and we thank you for the glory of your Son. God, we thank you that you, uh, God, you, you carried the weight of all these things and you've <laughs> removed them from the east to the west. God, we look forward to seeing you. We look forward to being with you forever. We ask that you would just be with us the rest of the night, God. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.